So in this video, I want to start talking about how one finds shortest paths from a given vertex to all of the other vertices in a graph. And this will lead us next week to talk about Dijkstra's algorithm that does this very effectively. And a variant of it would be used for things like sat-navs and Google Maps and so forth. But today I just want to do a special case, that in which the edges don't have weights. In the general situation, we shall assign numbers or weights or distances or costs to each edge. Uh, but for the moment, I just want to take each edge as counting as one unit. So we just have an ordinary graph and we want to find the shortest path from one vertex to another, meaning the path with the least number of edges, because each edge just counts once. So that's what we're going to do in this talk. And it's a simpler case because we shall do it by labeling the vertices. Uh, but we don't have to do any relabeling as in the full blown Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to do now is, is really the same as I did before when I did a BFS search, breadth first search. We're going to use, we're going to start with a, a vertex and add all of the adjacency vertices successively. Uh, but instead of sort of writing down numbers in a queue, because here nothing's been labeled to start with, we're just going to write down the number of steps we need to get uh, to each vertex. So it's really just an application. This special case is just an application of a breadth first search. Um, so I'm going to get on with it in a moment, but let me just record some facts about this graph. Uh, you can see all the vertices. There's a bit of an edge missing. Uh, first of all, you'll see there are arrows here, but this is completely irrelevant. I'm afraid I wasn't able to draw this graph without arrows on the computer. So just forget the arrows. They have nothing to do with what I want to talk about today. Later on, we will be dealing with digraphs, uh, graphs in which the edges are directed, but not, not for this study. Uh, the only use of the arrows is to remind you which vertex they go, they arrive, they go from or arrive at, uh, because some some edges sort of go underneath vertices. There's a much more complicated graph like this on sheet seven, and you need to know um, for for each edge, you need to know what vertex it goes between. Uh, so, for example, this this edge here. Uh, I'll show you the rest of it in a moment. This edge is not going, it's not touching this vertex. It's just going straight past it or underneath it. It's not incident at this vertex. That should be clear. Um, so the arrows are useful for that, but for nothing else. Now, this uh, graph actually has, you can see all the vertices, as I said, and it actually has 17 vertices. So let's record that, 17 vertices. And I believe it has, I made a mistake before, I believe it has 25 edges. And what we're going to do is we're just going to do a breadth first search. And in tracing our steps in that, we're going to therefore construct the BFS tree, the BFS spanning tree. Spanning means that it gets to all the vertices. The tree includes, it's a, the tree is in this context is a subgraph. Uh, it includes all the vertices, so it's a spanning tree. And it's formed uh, by the BFS process. And because it's a tree, that means a connected graph without cycles, or in this case, subgraph without cycles, it has, since there are 17 vertices, uh, vertices any tree has one edge less, so it has 16 edges. So essentially we're going to have to discard nine edges from the graph to get the tree and avoid any cycles. That's the point. Um, so let me start the let me start the process and uh, I just want to it's it's fairly obvious in this case because the graph is so simple uh, but I just want to show you how you can find systematically the 
if you like, the least distance of each vertex. So we're going to start from this vertex here. So this is our starting point, S. I label it with zero because the distance from S to itself is zero steps. Um, so I refer to distance. What I really mean is the number of edges in the path. Later on, it will be summing the, the weights associated to each edge. But for the moment, it's, it's just each edge counts one, irrespective of its length. OK, obviously, to get to this vertex, we just need one step. Um, to get to this vertex, we need two steps, therefore, from the start. And now we have some branching. We, we, this vertex is adjacent. Remember, we're doing a breadth first search. Breadth first search. So we look at all the adjacent vertices. And we're going to need an extra step to go to these. So they're going to be marked as three for three steps. Remember, this edge is going all the way around the side. It doesn't stop here. Uh, so now we've, we've labelled all the vertices which you can get to after three steps. And this algorithm tells you it's, it's going to be correct. It's a correct method of finding the number of steps, the least number of steps you need to get to a vertex from the start. So we then we then have three vertices labeled three. So we have a choice, like in the breadth first search, if you can always take the adjacent vertices, you can take the things in the queue, you can put things on the queue in any order. So here I actually put the one on the left first. So let's start with that one. And we use this to what, what we say scan its adjacent vertices. And these will obviously be given the number four. So there are lots of fours adjacent to this three, four of them, in fact, there they are. Uh, this already has a two, so it's no point me relabeling this two, because two is certainly the least distance. And then we go to the next three. Uh, now, this vertex already has a four, so there's nothing to do. Um, but there is this vertex here is adjacent to the second three, so that gets a four. This has a three, so we can't improve on the three. Uh, so we, that does this three. We now pass to the right hand three, and there are two new adjacency, two new vertices adjacent to this, so that gets a four, and then all the way around the top, this gets a four as well. So now we've done all the threes, now we look at the fours, and we've almost finished now. There are lots of fours, but not many vertices to label. Everything now can get to a, from, to get we can get from a four in one step. So here it's going to be a five. That means we can get to this vertex in five steps from the start. Similarly here, here, and here. OK, so we've now finished our labeling and the correctness of the algorithm, which I'm going to prove later, um, will confirm that these are the correct numbers. That's the least, the length of, in each case, a shortest path from the start to the vertex. Now, you may think this is a bit silly. Why are we wasting our time? Because it's sort of fairly obvious. But it's not quite so obvious, you see, because if you had slightly restricted vision, you might think that this four here required five steps. So I want to emphasize that this particular vertex is marked four, not five. Um, because you might, if you if you didn't see the the, the right hand side of the graph, you might say, well, I can get to, I really need to get to this vertex. I go one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five. I need five steps. But, but of course, that's because you haven't actually seen that you could go all the way around the outside in fewer steps if we're just counting edges. So we can actually get them four steps. And that, that shows you how systematic the method is. It's infallible. Um, now, I want to emphasize that this also constructs a tree. I should have sort of done that at the same time, because I now have to remember the actual choices I made. But I can in this case. Um, so I'm, going, I'm now going to highlight the BFS tree. Remember, we need only 16 edges. We must have a tree which only has 16 edges. So we're starting from this vertex here. And obviously we went to one, we went to two, and then we branched out. That much I remember at least. Didn't have any choice. So 
So certainly these form part, these edges form part of the tree. And then we have to remember what we did. Well, I took the, the left hand three and I joined that to its adjacent fours. So that's easy enough. And then we went to the middle three. Now the important thing is we did not join that to the four because this four is was already labelled. And in fact, had I had I if I were to join this, I'd get a cycle, so I wouldn't get a tree. In fact, the BFS method ensures that you never get any cycles. You always get a tree. Uh, we did, however, add this edge effectively to the tree. Um, and that, that dealt with this vertex. And then finally, we added for the, th for the threes, we added this edge here. And we added this edge all the way around the top. So these are added to the tree. And then we almost finished. We'd almost finished at this point. We added this edge to get to. Remember, it's a spanning tree. We have to reach all the vertices. Um, we added this five here, this edge, and these two edges here. Okay. And I don't have to count them. I'm assuming I haven't made a mistake. I know that there must be 16 edges here, 16 green edges. These are the green edges because there are, there are 17 vertices and it's a tree. Uh, the other thing that's worth uh, jotting down is that if you look at the nine edges which we have left out, these are mitted edges, and this is a characteristic of the BFS method. These have two types. These are of two types only. So the omit the omitted edges are of two types. The omitted edges, the nine edges that have been omitted uh, from the graph. To get the tree, so these, these, if you like, are in the original graph. Let me call that G, but not in the BFS tree, which I call T. Uh, these are of two types. Namely, they join the same. or adjacent levels of the tree. Or another way of saying that is that they link either, I'll uh, maybe highlight them separately, they link either equal numbers like three goes to three or four goes to four Or they link adjacent numbers like four and five. Uh, here's a four to four. Four and five is another four to four. I won't. I won't colour the adjacent ones. There's a three and a four. There's a three and a four, and there's a four and a five. That's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are our nine edges. So you see, they're of two types: the ones I've left uncoloured and then the pink ones. Uh, let me actually also just draw, start to draw the tree in a more conventional form, and then you'll understand better what I mean by the levels. You see, we've effectively, um, these numbers effectively tell us the level, the number of steps we need from the root. So a conventional way of drawing the tree would be to um, start with the root here at the top of the diagram, say, it's gone underneath me. Pull it down a bit. Um, and there we are. That's level zero. Then we went to level one, which is here. And then we went to level two in the tree. And then it branched out. So we had three branches of the tree corresponding to level three. And then this vertex here, this branched out into four sort of branches, more like twigs. And then uh, run out of space, but then we had one from here, maybe two from here, and the tree continued a bit down to the fifth level. So the idea is that the levels are just the number of steps from the root. So this, for example, here we had the three vertices at level three, and then we had all the vertices at level four, and so on. So the point is that in the original graph, we only added edges 
either between vertices in the same level or vertices um, in adjacent levels. Okay, that's with this with this example. That's how um, the this is a special case of Dijkstra's algorithm, um, and it's really just a BFS search in which we record really the levels we're getting to, which will give us the shortest distances, if you like, from a given vertex to all the other vertices. Okay, now what I want to do is explain why this works, why, why these labels do give the correct shortest distances. So let me do that now. I've prepared a sheet here, which I'll uncover bit by bit. Um, so, so if I can make this a bit bigger, maybe. So I, I want to just formalize what, what we what I've been saying. Uh, so the point is we're starting with a graph. A graph consists of a vertex set and an edge set, and we're taking um, we're we're taking a, a vertex to start from v zero, and some other vertex, let's say any other vertex in the graph, and we're looking for a shortest path from the start v zero to our arbitrary vertex v. Uh, shortest path today means the least number of edges. Uh, and I'm going to call that that shortest distance, if you like, or the number of edges, shortest distance from v0 to v. And I just mean it's the length of a shortest path, which today means the number of edges. When we have weighted graphs in which we assign numbers to edges, it will just be the sum of the weights. And you should think of d rel as distance, in fact, sd, shortest distance, or, or you can just think of it as distance. That's how I think about it. Although in practice, in problems, it might represent cost or some other measurement. Um, so as we know, as I've just shown you, and I'm not going to write down the rules for the algorithm because I've explained them before, but the BFS algorithm um, reveals these lengths by this labeling process that we've just carried out. So the BFS algorithm assigns to each vertex a label, in our case from forgetting zero from one to five. And what we have to show now is that this label does represent the correct shortest distance. Okay, that we, we what we've got to make sure is that for each vertex there isn't some secret path that somehow gets to that vertex more quickly. It's not entirely obvious. So the statement I'm trying to uh, prove is that the algorithm is what we say correct. That is that the label it assigns is indeed the length of a shortest path, and maybe more than one, from the start to that vertex. And that's true for every vertex in the graph. That's what we're trying to prove. Um, right, so in some sense you prove this by induction um, and I make this a bit smaller so the idea is this that We, we know that for each vertex, we've constructed a path to that vertex. For example, to get to the five at the top left, uh, we, we saw what the path was. It went all the way around the, the graph to get that five. Otherwise, it would have been a six. Um, so for each vertex, we do construct a path of, of in fact, of the, the length of that path is the label that we put on the vertex. So we know for certain that there is at least a path of that length to that vertex. So if there is another path of shorter lengths, that shorter length will be less than or equal to the label. So that's the first statement to make. So what we want to do here is to see if we can get a contradiction. Suppose we do have a vertex 
for which the shortest distance is less than its label. And if this occurs, it's going to occur for, I mean, let's suppose that we have this vertex for which we don't have equality, so for which the shortest distance is less than the label. Let's call this shortest distance k. And let's suppose that we can't find any vertices with the, for which the quality fails with shortest distance less than k. So another way of saying that informally is that there's no vertex v which is closer to the start uh, for which equality fails. So in other words, everything sort of works. The algorithm works up to le up to and including level k minus one. We're now looking at a vertex which uh, is a distance k from the start, and we want to check that its label is k. Okay, now what does it mean, this statement here, that, that there is a shortest path? What does this mean? Um, shortest path of length k. What it means is the sequence of edges, because a path is a sequence of edges from the start to the vertex v that needs k edges. So this is a shortest path. There is a shortest path from the start to the vertex v. And I put arrows on the edges, but really they're just edges. This is just a, a path, remember, it's just a sequence of edges in which you don't repeat any vertex. Now, the key observation is that if this is a shortest path, if I just take the part of it up to the penultimate vertex, this is also a shortest path. That's the key observation, because if it were not a shortest path, I could find a shorter path from v0 to vk minus 1, and that would give me a shorter path to v. And that would be a contradiction, because I'm assuming this is the shortest path. So that's a key observation. Any sort of subpath of a shortest path is a shortest path. So that means that we know, um, because we've got a smaller distance here, k minus 1, and we're assuming everything's OK up to and including k minus 1, we know the labelling is correct in that case. So what that means, I can reveal the whole lot now, is that, so I've just repeated here, so the first bit, this squiggle means all the edges, all the k minus 1 edges, this is also shortest path, that's what I've just said. And so because of our hypothesis, in, in a sense we're really using induction, uh, the label of this vertex must be correct. It must be the correct, it must give the correct distance. We must have equality here. So this is giving the shortest distance, which is k minus 1. <clears throat> okay, so this vertex vk minus 1 has been, has been correctly labeled k minus 1. But then in our algorithm, what we do is we look at all the adjacent vertices to that, and we label those, those vertices k. Uh, but we now know that the v is adjacent to this. So that would, in the algorithm, be labeled k. So v would have been labeled k. But that's a contradiction, because we're saying that L of v is bigger than k here. That was our starting hypothesis. So that's a contradiction. And so we can't have this situation in which the labels are different from the lengths of the shortest paths. So that's why this algorithm works. Um, and we'll get everything centered on the page, more or less. Um, and this is a special case, as I say, of Dijkstra's algorithm. But one can prove, if you know already about Dijkstra's algorithm, or you will next week, one can prove um, that Dijkstra's algorithm works. It's more complicated. But one can prove that it works in a similar way. And the proof of that is in the notes. I'm not going to go through it in a video, but it's relying on the let's make this a bit smaller. It's relying on the basic fact that if you have a what's called an optimal path, in this case the shortest path, then the um, any subpath is also a shortest path. I'll stop there.